so. Another seeker after knowledge enters my realm. I am Hermaeus Mora, Prince of Fate and Lord. Apocryphal, where all knowledge is hoarded. Now, perhaps you will be clever enough to uncover the secrets hidden here. If so, welcome. <laughs> perhaps you are a fool or a coward. If so, you are in peril. Need your book again, and this date before Apocrypha claims you forever.
myself, and the mercy of Hermaeus Mora was unexpected, but not unwelcome. Just another defiler that will be made to bow to the one true god. A cold wind blows from the void and propelling me forward. We shall overwhelm our enemies in a tempest of blackness and death. They shall all bend the knee or be destroyed when the dreadful one comes to claim. Welcome, dear viewers, to Couch Warrior TV on YouTube. I am the Couch Warrior, and you are watching Aranus Arcana, a Skyrim Let's Play, otherwise known as the Continuing Adventures of Fleet Featherstone. This is Chapter 14, Part 2, Episode 92. And I am so glad that you are back. And here we are following Fleet in the realm of Apocrypha. If you are not familiar with Apocrypha, Apocrypha is a realm of oblivion controlled by the Daedric Prince Hermaeus Mora. We were transported here at the end of the last episode by a black book. If you don't recall that, it was right at the very end, so you can go back and review the last few seconds of last week's episode, and you'll see that instance where Fleet opens the Black Book, and we are sucked into it. Um, some kind of some kind of tentacle with green glowing runes reaches out from the book and pulls us inside, and we find ourselves here in Apocrypha. Now, at the beginning of this episode... Uh, we were actually addressed by Hermaeus Mora himself, who basically is issuing us a challenge. Perhaps promising some rewards, if we can prove to be worthy of them. So at this point, Fleet is in survival mode. I do love Apocrypha. I have been through, I think, all but one of the realms of Apocrypha by now. And, uh, oh, it's just, it's just fabulous. It's, it's such a wonderful experience, so much different than anything else. Here we go. This is a Seeker. Now, the Seekers are basically souls that are doomed to search the endless stacks of books and papers in Apocrypha, searching for the things that they were seeking in life. And, uh... They seem to serve at the whim of Hermaeus Mora. They are quite often uh, apt to attack, so we have to watch out for them. And they are uh, they do have some cloak of invisibility. Not all the time, but frequently. So we have to be extra careful. All right. These pools are dangerous, so I'm going to scoot by this one with a roll. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, people, but I I just can't imagine this game being any more excited, exciting playing as any other character type than an assassin. Um, it's hard for me to imagine what the Apocrypha experience would be like if I was just trudging through it with a sword and shield. There's something about this experience that just lends itself to the stealthy character. So usually when I'm in Apocrypha, I make heavy use of the bow. Heavy use of the bow and stealth. 
And that is my strategy for staying alive here. Now, what does Fleet know about Apocrypha? Well, he knows that he's in the realm of Apocrypha now. He's been told that by Hermaeus Mora. He knows who Hermaeus Mora is, and that Hermaeus Mora is a presence who brought him here. This is an interesting turn of events for Fleet, because, as you know, we are targeting Daedric Princes. So Hermaeus Mora is one of those who would reasonably be on our list. He has now presented himself to us, and that is going to work to our advantage. It is one more Daedric Prince that we are able to track now. It's Lurker. I'm going to take him out. One more shot ought to do it. Oh, maybe two. Come on now. But as I was saying before, many of you are here because you love Assassin gameplay, and you're a rabid fan of, of the stealthy character like I am. Um, I play a stealthy character in almost every game um, I've ever played, including Fallout 3. I played a, a stealthy sniper-type guy, which was super fun. I always seem to go to that play style. Now, I have played through... Skyrim with several other character types, but I always go back to the Assassin for the best experience. That's where I have the most fun. So, All right, looks like we have a few things to gather here. I, it's the one thing I do like uh, about this realm as well, is it's just loaded to the gills with loot. We got a level there, that's great. So one thing we do know is we, we have some beginning knowledge of the Black Books. If you remember a couple episodes ago, we ran into a madman out on the island who was claiming that something had been placed in his head by a Black Book that he was trying to get out of his head. And he described the Black Book to us. And then, consequently, we had to kill him when he attacked us. But that was our first inkling that there were these black books and that there was something important or powerful about them. He told us of the location of a black book, but we have not gone to retrieve that yet. Now, this black book, we ran across this one purely by accident. So now our experience with this book has given us an appreciation for the reality of what these books really are. Now we understand they're real. We understand that at least this one took us to Apocrypha. We don't know what the other one will do. But this kind of solidifies the fact that it is something that we're going to need to pursue. There's a lot of books here. We'll take the gold. I think I'm going to leave the rest of this stuff. I do love the books, but I don't want to get overburdened with books. The other thing here, too, is that once we have read a black book, that black book is re is added to our inventory. So we can pull that book out anytime we want to and travel to Apocrypha through it. So if I want to come back here and do anything or, you know, get any more loot, I can come back anytime I want to do that. Okay. Let's take a look at what we got here. Activate Companion Insight, Lover's Insight. Lover's Insight. Do 10% more damage and get 10% better prices from people of the opposite sex. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Let's look at some of these other ones. What's this? Companion's Insight. Your attacks, shouts, destruction spells do no damage to your followers. That's kind of nice. And Scholar. Reading skill books gives you an extra skill point. I'm not going to go with Scholars because we've already read many, or probably most of the skill books that are out there to read. I'm going with Lovers.
Welcome back, brothers and sisters. Well, it seems we have a lot to talk about. But first, we need to send some souls to Sithis. Looks like we've got Reavers down here. So we are going to deal with them as quickly as possible and get on with things. There's one. Let's relocate. Okay, the chief isn't up, so we will take him in the middle of his dinner. Easy money. From a surprise. Very nice. Now there's usually a guard down this way. Oh, we need her to stop. Come on back. Here we go. That should get us out of immediate danger. Now, we've actually been through a lot, so we're going to take an opportunity to explore this place just a little bit. Maybe at least get a little something to eat. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, the dear viewers and followers of this story. Um... I can't tell you how uh, inspiring a lot of the comments were from the last episode. I put a ton of work into that episode trying to make it trying to make it an episode that was worthy of the the shift in the story that was taking place there. And uh, you know, you guys always make it rewarding to do that. I I have some of the best uh, most intelligent fans on YouTube that, that you can imagine. The comments were really great. And there was a tremendous spike in just about every category on my YouTube channel last week. So <clears throat> I wanted to just take this opportunity to say thank you to you all for your comments. We had a huge uh, spike in likes, a spike in comments, a spike in views, and a spike in subscriptions. And um, as far as I can tell, it's because of the content. So I can't maintain this quality of content, and I can't maintain this, this pace without knowing that people are appreciating the work. And you guys never have made me feel unappreciated for it, so I want to thank you for that. And we are going to continue to produce this story as long as I possibly can, or until the story comes to a conclusion. And then after that, I have no idea what happens. When this story is done, I really have no idea what happens. Um, I don't know. This, I could come up with something new, but I don't know if it would be Skyrim. It would have to be, it would have to be some, it would have to be a platform that gives me the same level of flexibility that I have here. Um, otherwise, I would have no fun making the story, and it certainly wouldn't be as engaging as this has been. And it's hard for me to imagine doing like a straight up playthrough after having produced a story like this. Um, I've been kind of, since the beginning of this, slowly finding my style. And I think I've found it. And this is what I like to do. So my thought is that if I were going to do something, uh, another story after this one, it would have to be a platform that would give me the same level of flexibility and control so that I could do the artistic things I like to do. Who knows what that is? It could be something like Fallout 3, perhaps, completely different genre, or it could be another run-through of Skyrim, or it could be that this story just goes on and on <laughs> until uh, until Bethesda uh, releases uh, The Elder Scrolls VI, and then I start all over again in a completely new environment. Who knows? Anyway... Just a couple of words of thanks to all you viewers. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Now, about the story. Now, this is... We, we just had an encounter with Sithis. That is Fleet's second encounter with Sithis. The first encounter with Sithis was back in Chapter 10. And, uh, well, was it? And actually, the end of... Well, it took place in the last part of chapter 9, but it was actually explained in the first part of chapter 10. And that is where we 
introduced this concept of the Heart of Smoke. And uh, just a quick review. The Heart of Smoke, of course, is something of a spell or a blessing or, or something like that that Sithis has put directly on fleet that protects his soul or his spirit from basically uh, being controlled by anybody, including the Daedra. Uh, so, uh, in essence, what that allows him to do is it, is it allows him to act as an agent of Sithis regardless of the target. Um, so that is when we started on this campaign of really trying to confiscate the items of power from the Daedric Princes because we knew that, that we were protected. So, this is our second encounter with Sithis. And uh, there's really nothing um, in the dialogue that I wish to explain. Um, I wrote it out because it, it was... Um, I was trying to create what seemed like uh, the right experience for Sithis. So there was a lot of distortion, a lot of echo, a lot of interesting things going on there. Dead. So I went ahead and... Uh, printed a copy for that and let it scroll as it was happening. So if you need to go back and read any of the details, they're certainly available there. I recognize the fact that when I do a lot of sound design work, sometimes things get distorted. Um, and in this particular case, that's really how I wanted it to be. I don't... When I when I think of, of Sithis, I, I don't think of him necessarily being in the business of exposition or straightforward communication. Um, when I think of of a god like Sithis, who is separate from the physical world and always has been, it's it's interesting to imagine how a creature like that would view communication. And so um, I take some liberties there. I, I try some things uh, and sort of try to portray what I feel is kind of the appropriate mood for interaction with a god um, is something even even greater than a god when you think about it. Um, one of the original uh, entities or spirits in the universe. So, anyway. It's interesting task to try to take an event like that and, and make it seem big and epic and godlike. So, uh, I worked on that particular sound design piece and the video that goes with it. In, in total, it probably took me four hours or so to put that one segment together in a way that I felt was satisfactory. So if you need to go back and review it, please feel free. But uh, what Fleet discovered on the bottom of the pool was a mask that was left for him by... Sithis, or Padme, as it were, which he swam down and got. And if you didn't uh, quite catch that, um, there was a transformative moment there as well, um, where emerging from the water with the ink washed out of his hair, he was back to the white hair, and then he cleaned himself up and is back to kind of the look of, of fleet that we've grown accustomed to. Uh, with the white hair and the white beard and the mohawk, he kind of cleaned himself up. He no longer has a need for disguise. And it's worth mentioning, in the last episode, we, we talked about that a little bit, how he had enhanced his disguise slightly. Well, he knew going into his encounter with Miravel that he was going to try to seduce her over to his side. However, he had to put some stopgap measures in place in case that were to fail. Now, there's two things that he did. One thing was to use a spell to transport her down into the pit in his place, knowing that she couldn't escape. She would be vulnerable. She'd be forced to talk to him. So that protected him. Uh, the second thing that protected him was coloring his hair, coloring his beard. That gives him also an additional level of protection. So if he did get to a point in the conversation where he revealed his face to her, um, he would still have some degree of anonymity by both his disguise and his distance from her. So the gesture was there. 
but the full reveal was not. So if for some reason that encounter with Miravel went south, he would not be completely compromised. That was the idea behind all of that. So now we know that we have established a connection with Miravel. We have established at least enough trust that we know we're going to meet up with her in a couple days, and she seems open to this arrangement as long as it gets her what she needs. So at this point, the need for that level of disguise is no longer necessary because we have achieved that trust level that we were looking for. So he can go back to his old look, of course, understanding that a hood and a mask is going to be pretty much standard. Now, so the objective here is uh, I'm going to loot this area. We're, we'll, we're going to finish up kind of looking through this area where these reavers are camped out. And then it's back to Raven Rock we go. And we are going to uh, tie up some loose ends. One of the things that I will be doing back in Raven Rock is getting freaking serious about crafting and leveling. Um, it just has to happen. And uh, I'm going to do it off camera, so you aren't going to see a lot of it, but I'm going to talk about it a little bit later. Um, I've got a whole bunch of soul gems that are encumbering me right now. I may as well use them. I'm going to crank on some levels in uh, enchanting. There is also an alchemy trainer there. I'm going to crank on some levels in alchemy because we have lots of cash that we could spend on training. And I'm going to sell a bunch of stuff. And I'm going to create some, some new and interesting weapons. So that is the plan. And I will go over that, that loadout situation in a bit more detail to come. So here we are back in Raven Rock. We really weren't all that far away, it turns out. Load in Vela. Captain and back to the netch we go. Your visit here will be tolerated as long as you abide by our laws. Otherwise, you'll answer to the Redoran Guard. yet? Please, tell Glover me, Mallory's the name. If you're looking for a smith, you found one of the best. So, you finally tracked down old Crescius, eh? Quite a character, isn't he? Tell you what, since you went through all the trouble of finding it for me and all, you keep it. I just wanted to remind that codger you can't just go around taking things from other people. Now that you've delivered the message, I'm satisfied. Besides, that pickaxe hasn't done me any good in years. Maybe you can put it to good use. Bring your weapons and armor to me. I'll fix it up right. Haldir's Journal. Entry 1. First Encounter with Fleet. My search for Fleet has been a difficult one. He's been elusive, to say the least. It was that one chance encounter in Riverwood that inspired me to continue the search. Otherwise, I may have quit this pursuit weeks ago. It was also during that encounter that I came to realize that the one I was searching for was quite possibly taken. Most people do not understand the work of a battle mage. Many have this idea that we are all fireballs and lightning bolts on the field of battle, but that type of display is reserved for the novices. The most powerful of us are often focused on the more mundane aspects of supporting an army, both at home and in the field. Activities such as messaging, logistical support, reconnaissance, intelligence work. That's all the bread and butter of the battle mage. 
Senchen was the most gifted warlock I had ever seen in the areas of clandestine work and intelligence gathering. I, on the other hand, served the king in other capacities. It was my job to sniff out spies in the court, reveal assassins in our ranks, and detect traps and poisons that might harm the king. It's this experience that has led me to believe that fleet may have been taken. I didn't hear him behind me, but it was the feeling of a presence in the room that caused me to turn around. There he stood, after all the searching. The boy, now very much a man, stood before me, and as he looked me in the eye, the air seemed to grow thick. He was now a tall and graceful man, with a strong bearing of authority and menace. His face was concealed, but it was his one remaining eye that gave him away. I could never forget the silver eyes, distinctive eyes he shared with his father. Clad in black, his garb was not unlike what a priest might wear. He cut an imposing figure. Our conversation started simply enough. I greeted him as Little Feather. The effect was interesting. I observed a subtle surge of recognition, as if he'd been touched by a small shock, and then we locked eyes again. I allowed the silence to draw out until he casually spoke my name in greeting. When I asked him how he was, he did not respond, but I could see him search my face, trying to discern my motivations. I told him that I'd been searching for him because I was worried. It sounded ridiculous even as I said it, and I could see his posture of menace return in his body language. I was not trying to elicit a reaction from him, but it seems that's what I managed to accomplish. When next he spoke, it was with a commanding, sort of ethereal voice that sounded like fleet, but there was something else there, something unfamiliar and unpleasant. My years of experience have taught me to recognize when the physical form of a person has been compromised. What I saw in our brief exchange was something fascinating and frightening at the same time. He was calm and serene, exhibiting none of the tics I have come to associate with powerful suggestion spells, and yet it was apparent that the one to whom I was speaking was not fleet, but someone or something else. Something very dangerous. After several moments of conversation, it was clear that I was not going to be able to influence him in any way, so I have to change my plan. This is no longer a rescue mission. In order to understand what has happened to Fleet, I need time. I need time to observe him. I asked if I might accompany him in his travels for a time and lend my sword to his fight. He reluctantly agreed. He told me that if I were to come, I must follow his every command if I wished to survive. When I informed him that I could take care of myself against any enemy, he casually stated that it was not the enemy I had to fear. The threat was clear. I will take this opportunity to watch him and make observations. If this is a suggestion spell, it is unlike anything I have ever seen. If it is not a glamour or suggestion, the alternative is truly terrifying. The name is Rallis. Rallis Sedaris, out of Morhol. I've got a financier waiting for me back on the mainland. Sent me here in the interests of obtaining some rare antiquities. Welcome back to the story, dear viewers. But this whole thing became a disaster right quick, let me tell you. What happened? You come out of the northern ashlands, you don't expect things to go easy, you know. But this was something outside my particular expertise. When I first got to Colbjorn, you couldn't even see it. Buried in the ash. Like most other Absolutely enemies, love this, this guy's voice. Dug out a pile of the stuff taller than me just to find the barrel. Who knows how much to reach the door. Excavating isn't exactly my specialty. 
even if it was the ash storms fill it in faster than you can dig. Why not hire some miners out of you Raven Rock? Think I got that kind of money? No, I only get paid on delivery. Can't afford to go out of pocket for a thousand septums. Thousand septums. Takes money to make money, all that rot. There's a lot of it at the other end, but I can't get there without a little kick to start it off. I've got some money. Are you looking for a partner? What? Are you... Are you serious? Yeah. Well, I think I could make that work. We can sort out the details of our little arrangement later. But for now, I'll manage the dig if you can manage the coin. Do you have the gold? Oh, yes. Of course. Mm. It's all here. Well, then. Looks like I have a good bit of work to start on. I'll head back to Raven Rock and round up some diggers. Once we've got something worth looking at, I'll send word to you. Pleasure doing business with you, partner. I'll see you soon. Very good. We have entered into a business arrangement with Rala Sedaris, who is excavating the barrow at Kolbjorn. And if you recall, we were drawn here specifically to this place, to Kolbjorn, by Sithis, who mentioned this barrow by name in our encounter with him. If you missed that, go back and have a little review. So, let's take care of some housekeeping items. Um, as you probably gathered by the last segment, we are now accompanied by the follower Haldir, the battle mage, who is with us. He is now uh, incorporated into amazing follower tweaks and is functioning as a pure mage. And he will be accompanying us for a while. Also, between the end of the Red Skull Barrow adventure and our return to the Retching Netch, I took the opportunity to do some crafting and some leveling in Raven Rock. Now, I did that off camera, obviously. You haven't seen any of that footage. But I wanted to give you a rundown of what I accomplished there. There is uh, a trainer in alchemy there. I think I've mentioned previously I did train several levels in alchemy, did some enchanting, and I crafted some items. You may notice now that in order to accommodate the mask that was gifted to us by Sithis, um, I had to come up with a different hood. The contractor hood, or the hood that comes with the contractor mod outfit, uh, does not function with this mask. It doesn't. And it has something to do with the way the mask is assigned as apparel. And uh, some masks are assigned as, as hats. Some masks uh, or hoods are assigned as circlets. And depending on which it is, that will determine how the thing operates. And we got some ash spawn here. And this is our first opportunity to see uh, Haldir at work. It's kind of fun. Come on now. There we go. It's going to be interesting to work in concert with a mage. Um, especially a mage of considerable power. So we'll see how he does. So, in other words, I, I was, in order to make the mask work with a hood, I had to go to the hood that was part of our outfit when we were sporting the silencer gear. Now, as you may imagine, going to this mask and hood means that we are not getting the full benefits of the death brand armor. Um, and... So this kind of, this arrangement is temporary, but I thought it was interesting enough that uh, Fleet would definitely, would definitely don the mask at this point, um, thinking that it has some significance or power or importance. 
So I have created an outfit temporarily to accommodate that, and it just I'm mainly is a change in the headgear. I've also Go on ahead. crafted a new dagger. I, I have crafted uh, a steel blade featuring a woman's form for the handle. Uh, it's beautiful and elegant and uh, very wicked in terms of damage. Uh, with the levels that I increased in enchanting, I was also able to create a new set of smithing gear. So this dagger does a significant amount of damage over and above our Akaviri short blade. Let's take these guys. Surprise. Who's next? Let's finish that guy off. Okay, here we go. Come on in. There's an opener. Keep him at bay with a bow punch. Bam! There you have it. I am really beginning to appreciate the effectiveness of the bow punch. Uh, it is working remarkably well for me. It is basically the equivalent of a block. Now, I haven't uh, done any research to determine whether or not I will gain blocking levels using it. Uh, if I do, that's just a bonus, but uh, there have been a number of occasions here just in the last uh, two or three episodes where it has been a huge benefit, so I think we're going to make that an official addition to our arsenal of techniques. Okay, I'm not sure what this place is all about. This is obviously a waypoint um, as we head to Fort Frostmouth, so... Rodolph, light and strength. I feel your words are not your own, and I worry dearly for your health. I beg you, please depart that blasted isle and return to solitude at once. My nights have been almost impossible to bear without you. To lose you would be the death of me. If you do not return soon, I will come for you. Okay. A letter from a lover. And speaking of lover, something about the serene nature uh, of the um, expression on the mask that was gifted to us by Sithis and the combination of the power that we selected, uh, in other words, um, influence and more damage over individuals of the opposite sex, uh, seemed to lend itself to this idea that um, Fleet has some sort of beguiling capability when it, when it comes to women. And that was also part of the reason for my crafting of that particular dagger um, with the woman's body as the uh, hilt. And we will probably talk about that more in coming episodes. I've arrived in Solstein and moved into an old house on the hill by the shore. Whoever lived here before is long gone. I can see well out into the waters from this vantage and hear all things behind and around. Dunmer bandits wander the wood at night, but I don't fear them. There is a calling from the depths, a rumbling drone that sings to me at night. I've started sleeping in the basement, keeping a knife near. The call is loudest down here. I will be ready for whatever is coming. It is as if a great machine reverberates beneath me. I tire of waiting for the collar underneath to emerge. I walked to town, bought some digging tools, shovel, pick, and started to break down the wall behind the bookshelf. I dig down slow, slow going, and put the bookshelf back when I'm finished digging. Why? No house guests here, but I feel I have something to hide sure what the numbers mean. These numbers have to be important. How can I make Bjorn hear what I have heard? I must not lose him, yet I must remain in this place, for I know I will know the truth soon. The murmur in the earth and I we talk. I lay my head against the dirt. Fire from the deep. 